We're glad you're here. And once again, I am vindicated. The things that I've been saying about the Minnesota courts, front page of the Star Tribune says, Justices spared financial disclosure. Why? I mean, why did they say that? Why didn't they start with judicial transparency in Minnesota is one of the worst in the nation? You know, but justices are spared. Uh, you know, interesting wording. But I am glad that the Star Tribune, excuse me, the Pioneer Press, the Pioneer Press has this article. Now, of course, I said at the beginning of the show, we discuss things that the press refuses uh, to show you and ignores what's going on, especially our judiciary. But the Pioneer Press, give them credit, they, uh, they came out with this article and uh, it's, it's very good and again it vindicates what I'm saying but we're going to go through this article discuss it get your comments and questions ready so this is a live show call in 651-747-3838 and uh, also what's new if you want to see some of my past shows go to youtube.com uh, backslash speechless mn and uh, you can find my shows, uh, and we'll start getting those out to you. Uh, but this will be put up, and you'll be able to see this show tonight. We'll be able to see on YouTube tomorrow, uh, maybe even later tonight, but we're going to say tomorrow just because uh, it takes time. Uh, but we've been talking about the judiciary quite a bit, so we'll, we'll get into this article because there's some very good statements made in there, and there's some very, um, there's statements in there that show that uh, the cover-up is still going on and will continue to go on. Uh, but it's a very good article, and thank you, viewers, for bringing this to my attention. I had not seen that. It just came out today, but I hadn't seen it, but he brought it to my attention. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, it is the Christmas season, and, um, you know, for the show tonight, we're going to give you some uh, um, updates on court cases that have taken place from guests that have been on the show. Unbelievable amazing a ruckus almost a riot in the courtroom people storming out yelling at the judge we'll give you an update on that uh, and some of the other ones uh, but before we do that since we just had our snowfall that looks like winter is here for good uh, you know for the next few months who knows it could still melt but I watched a video yesterday that I just thought was uh, uh, very interesting. So uh, we can change the graphic here um, uh, because we're going to talk about this movie, The Star of Bethlehem, and we're going to show a little clip of it because I, I was just fascinating, uh, fascinated by it. And this man, uh, the producer is Stephen McEvity, and it's uh, Unlock the Mystery of the World's more Most Famous Star, The Star of Bethlehem. And he describes how it could happen. And what's interesting is uh, the Bible talks a lot about stars and the constellations. You know, and people said these are for Greek goddesses and gods and stuff like that. And it's from Greek. No, it goes back to Job. It goes back to the beginning of time. And what's interesting is that because of Kepler and because of other scientists after Kepler, Kepler put the foundation in and did the mathematical formula so we know the stars, where they are, the rotations of the earth and the planets. He really set it all up. And now with uh, advanced math and computers, we can actually, from where our stars are today, you can, you can go to, and there's a website, and uh, you, you're going to have to go to this website to find the other website that says, uh, the website there, Bethlehem Star Movie. Uh, dot com. You're going to have to go to that website to find the other website where you can go and you can find out from any position on the earth what the stars looked like at any, at a, any point in time in history uh, according to this mathematical formula of Kepler. And um, this man did this and found out some fascinating things because the Bible says certain things about the stars. And I'm going to show you a glimpse, but this is fascinating in itself 
I'm not even beginning to see the whole picture. And the whole picture gets put together in this DVD, and yet it's, it's not the whole picture. It's part of the whole picture, but it's so fascinating what's, what's there on the Bethlehem Star. Uh, it's, it's amazing. So let's uh, play the video, uh, Nathan, and uh, go from there. And because this event is simply so spectacular, whether they believe in God or not, they're going to show you this, this shot. Um, I'm going to kind of cheat as I show it to you, though, because the, the, uh, observation back then was all naked eye observation. They had no lenses. So I'm going to cheat. I'm going to zoom in because I want to show you guys. I'm going to take you in on the secret of what's happening here. They couldn't zoom, but we can. So I'm going to zoom in way in. Until finally I get those two objects separated. One of them's Jupiter. The other one's another planet. You're going to tell me which one, too. Men are from Mars. Women are from Venus. That's the mother planet. Venus is the mother planet. So we have Jupiter, the king planet, and Venus, the mother planet, coming into very close conjunction. That seems kind of pregnant, doesn't it? In fact, they got even closer than that. Let me wind time forward just a little bit. What I'm trying to show you is that they really stacked like a figure eight. So they didn't block each other's light. They added. What you had then was two stars stacked on top of each other, too close together to separate with the naked eye. And so to an observer, it appeared to be the brightest star anyone alive had ever seen. Um, you, we know the math, and so I can tell you that no one alive had ever seen a star that bright. That was it. I believe the star of Bethlehem was the brightest star. So we've seen the birth of a king in the sky. We've seen the brightest star. But now we have the issue of it being in the south. Remember when they were traveling from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, the star is said to have been before them, ahead of them. In the, so it would have to be in the southern sky. So let's go back to the sky, see if Jupiter did that. They've now traveled to Jerusalem. It's November. I've given them some time for travel. This is south. Remember, uh, Bethlehem is due south of Jerusalem. And then 7 in the morning, sure enough, there in the sky, in the southern sky, is Jupiter over the little town of Bethlehem. Now the hard part, though. Can a star stop? How can a star stop? That was a puzzler. Because we all know stars can't stop. I mean, physics and inertia prevent that. So I puzzled all of that hard. I worried about that one until I realized that I had the problem upside down. And I had it backwards. The problem is not that stars can't stop. The problem is that all stars are always stopped. I mean, they move like the hour hand on your watch. You can't see it. You know it's moving, but you can see it move. Well, if the problem is that stars are always stopped, what can Matthew have meant by saying the star stopped? And I thought, retrograde motion, because of course, stars do stop, planets do, in, in their movement through the field of fixed stars. They stop, they even reverse course. And that's how I think retrograde motion explains what the star stopping was. So did Jupiter do that? Let's have a look. I'll animate Jupiter and let it drop a tail. And there you see it, sure enough, Jupiter comes to a full stop and reverses course over the little town of Bethlehem. But I want to show you another screen that's more fun because I can throw dates with it. Now what I'm going to do on this one is I'm going to let Jupiter fly through the field of fixed stars and it's going to throw off dates so we can tell when these events are happening. The first one there, I know it's small, I'll read it for you. It says 1030 of 2 BC. Now let's fly Jupiter. You see it moving through the fixed stars. There's, that says 1125 of 2 BC. And it's slowing up. It's going to stop right about here. Reverse course. The date when it stopped over the little town of Bethlehem, 1225 of 2 BC. Does that date sound familiar? Well, Mr. Larson, you mean they, st they went down there on Christmas? Well, it turns out that's true. Um, am I saying that Jesus was born on 1225? No, I'm not saying that at all. Absolutely. In fact, I don't think anyone thinks that. No, I, what I'm saying is that that is quite, literally, quite possibly the date of the first Christmas. Did it have any meaning to them? No, it had no meaning. The date had no meaning to them because they didn't even use our calendar system. I mean, but it does have meaning to us. It All right. uh, fascinating. And you, you, you got to go to the website, the Bethlehem Star, uh, or Bethlehem Star Movie.com. You go to that star website. But I would, this movie is fascinating. I'd watch it. Uh, one, just to learn about the stars or get this perspective of what's going on. As you see, this was talking about uh, the southern star, the stars from the south. And so these wise men 
We don't know how many. People say three, but we don't. There's three gifts. We don't know how many wise men. That's not declared in the Bible. But it's. Uh, but the Bible says they're from the east. They saw the star while they were in the east, so they're looking to the south. And in that looking at the, uh, at the star, these were Jewish wise men because when Israel was exiled into Babylon, uh, and then Babylon let the people go back to Jerusalem. Not all the Jewish people left. They still had their uh, universities, in our language, their study groups. They studied the stars. Stars was a part of their, their life. I mean, that was nighttime entertainment. And remember, it was bright because there wasn't all the, the stuff that gets in the way that we have get in our way up here. Matter of fact, uh, I, I was waiting for the bus and I looked up in the sky and there was a crescent moon, beautiful, clear sky. And then, you know, if you held your hand out like this and uh, up, there's the moon and right down there was a bright star, probably Venus. I mean, it was bright. And I, I don't pay attention. I haven't paid attention much to stars. I've started getting more involved. Um, but there was this brilliant, probably Venus, beautiful. It was just a beautiful sight of this huge bright star with the moon. It was brighter than the moon. I mean, it looked brighter than the moon, just uh, glaring out. I got to find out what it was. Um, but I was on a, a men's retreat for our church just a couple weeks ago, and one guy brought up his telescope, and it had a filter on it, and we looked at the sun and the sunspots, just beautiful. And I saw Jupiter and the four planets, you know, just lined up in a, four moons just lined up right in a row. Uh, it, was, it was something else. It's a beautiful sight to see. Uh, of course, it's not as clear as if you had a Hubble uh, website or you know the Hubble pictures uh, it's not as clear because of all the atmospheric uh, interference we have but man something else but boy you want to be entertained you want to learn something that and this just gets you going uh, the, the star of Bethlehem uh, very very good video to watch okay well, uh, that's a, that hope, I hope that starts your uh, Christmas off well and gets you in the mood for Christmas. Um, now we're going to come back to uh, uh, some other form of reality, because this is a form of reality. Um, I'm going to give an update on Leah Bankin's case. Uh, she's been on the show. She's a mother who uh, has been court-ordered that she cannot see her children at all. She doesn't even have supervised visits with her kids. Now she's asking for unsupervised parenting time. And she had a motion before the court, Judge Perkins, asking the judge to give her time with the kids. Understand this very significant point is that Leah Bankin has had five psych evals, all of them coming out clean. She just spent $2,000 on another psych evaluation. Um, and that psych evaluation said that she's fine. There's nothing wrong with her. Now, understand this. In order to take children away from a parent, and of course it's a divorce case, the judge has to have a reason. Under statute 518.157, a judge has to have a reason to take a child away. It has to state that reason, and it has to be a legal reason. In other words, harmed, harming of the children. But Judge Perkin has never said why she can't see her kids. Never, uh, as my understanding of the case. And so um, Judge Perkin, uh, well, Leah Bankin was asking him, state the reason under this statute why I cannot see my children. State the reason. And he said, eventually, he just got ticked off at her and said, stop living in the past and get over it. Stop living in the past and get over it. 
This is a motion before the court asking the judge to do his job. Now remember, Judge Perkins, as we've stated on my show uh, about three weeks ago, got hammered by the appellate courts. I mean hammered. They just said, you, you've denied this person, other person due process. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. You know, re reversing and remanding back to court to tell you do your job. Now, of course, Perkins, and we've seen this happen to other people, and J Perkins is losing it. I mean, he's, he's lost his mind, in my opinion, and the legislature needs to step up and impeach this guy because he's violating a person's constitutional right. And, of course, this goes right down to parental rights. Um, and understand you in Minnesota don't have them. There's no due process in our Minnesota courts. There's no... Uh, high standard you know they just take your kids away because they want to that's the standard how a judge is feeling that particular day and in my opinion how much money they get for the deal we'll get into that later on so when judge perkins told leah bankin stop living in the past and get over it immediately the the people in the courtroom reacted their gasp. One, one person got up and yelled, shame. Of course, they left the courtroom right away. And other people yelled out other things. And um, just a lot of commotion. And at that point, what Judge Perkins did was even worse. He gaveled the room quiet, which he should have. Okay, no problem with that. But what instead of ordering everybody out of the courtroom... He stopped the case right then and there, and Leah Banking couldn't present any more of her case. Um, so, and, you know, that's, this is the scam that goes on in our courts because there was other motions filed in this case by the father in this situation, and the attorney for the father was going, no, Leah Banking needs another psych evaluation, another one. That was his motion. And so, I mean, this is harassment uh, beyond harassment. Um, there's no psych evaluation that's needed. You got one. But that's the game that the courts play. Well, your psych evaluation was a day ago. You need a new one now. Of course, I'm being facetious on that. But, no, your psych evaluation was six months ago. Things could have changed. Well, if it was okay back then, what evidence do you have that it's changed? And they don't care. And uh, this is, I mean, this is bad, bad, <laughs> bad news. Okay, well, you know, pray for Leah Bankin. Pray for the kids. Um, pray that our legislatures would stand up and act like men you know, and do their job and hold these judges accountable that aren't protecting our family. Without the family, the state doesn't exist. The state becomes, um, the state is the family, and that's not how it's to be. Uh, you, the state ends up eating itself and destroying itself. And we, we can't, I mean, it's, it's the end, you know, the end of the world <laughs> uh, when that happens in too many societies. No society has existed without the family being strong. Once the family gets torn apart, the society goes downhill. Uh, so, okay, that's Leah Bankin's case. Now let's deal with um, uh, Sandra Rucky Gra or Gra Grazzini Rucky. Her case... Uh, was issued an order. She was on the show uh, here this last month where there's been over 89 motions with over 3,400 orders uh, by Judge Knudsen. Of course, Judge Knudsen was a former Republican state rep. Uh, Judge Knudsen's dad was a state senator. And I also believe he ended up being a judge also in the Dakota County area. I'm not positive about that, but I think he ended up being a judge. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, nepotism going on here in the courtroom. There's a picture of David Knudsen. Uh, so David Knudsen went and 
uh, was misbehaving in court. In other words, these orders were issued without hearings. Uh, there were ex parte, 3,400, uh, in, in the way I understand it and the way I read it. Um, no give and take going on in these, in these orders. And, you know, even the transcripts or even the court records are being messed with, as, I, as from what I can see. Um, they're actually going back and correcting the record, and and correcting may be the wrong term, um, but they're they're definitely adding more information, and some of it's being taken out as to what's transpired in this case, from what I can see. And because of all this effort by Judge Knudsen uh, on Sandra Grazzini uh, Rucky. Uh, Sandra's attorney, Michelle McDonald, filed a federal lawsuit against Judge Knudsen for violating due process and constitutional rights. And uh, in federal court, straight to the U.S. Supreme Court. And, and that, m those, that motion to the U.S. Supreme Court hasn't been accepted yet, but they got it and they said, send us the briefs and we'll order the opposing side to send us briefs also, and then they'll dig into it further. So it's been accepted to a point where they want to know what's going on at the Supreme U.S. Supreme Court does, uh, but it still hasn't been accepted by the U.S. Supreme Court to hear. And I, my understanding is it's a writ of mandamus. Um, and there's a lot of jurisdictional issues involved here. I don't know how it's going to end up, but that's been accepted uh, in, a, in, in the first step of the process. They got it, now file the briefs. Okay, here's the, here's the other. So that would happen the day before Sandra Grazzini Rucky's case, and uh, Judge Knutson then arrested Michelle McDonald, and what I mean by that is that uh, Michelle McDonald took a picture, my understanding, outside the courtroom at the court calendar of the day, and then and asked permission to do that, and then went in the courtroom, took a picture, but their court was not in session. Judge Knutson issued an arrest uh, warrant that I know, that I my understanding, and then Judge. Knutson then, when Michelle McDonald came into the courtroom, was defending her client in this divorce case, and uh, another mother who can't see her kids at all, with no evidentiary hearings yet. This was the evidentiary hearing, and took uh, uh, when there was a recess, had Michelle McDonald, Sandra's attorney arrested for taking pictures in the courtroom. Of course, they never told her that. Of course, this is not a criminal activity. There's a rule, but it's a, it's a ridiculous rule. And actually, I have tried, well, I'll get to that later, about cameras in the courtroom. Uh, Michelle uh, was arrested, ended up spending about 30 hours uh, under arrest, had to go back into the courtroom and defend her client in handcuffs, but her client wasn't there. The judge made it seem like everybody, that everything was over, so everybody went home. The court took Michelle McDonald's court papers, uh, client, privileged client papers, and took them off the desk and put them aside. Well, Judge Knutson came out with his order in that divorce case just a couple days ago, and he spent 72 pages, 72 pages on why he arrested or why Michelle McDonald was arrested, and he said he had, my understanding, that he had nothing to do with it. This is what I've uh, understood as to what I've been told by various parties, and I have still yet to read that divorce case, but just 72 pages on why uh, Michelle McDonald, the attorney, was arrested. 
unbelievable. I just, uh, it's just unfathomable that this is taking place. Uh, this is another judge that, in my opinion, is on the loose, uh, has mentally gone down the hill, and is now, you know, they get to the point where, oh, oh I've been caught, now what, now what do I do? I'm just, you know, I'm just going to do whatever, and I'm going to do whatever I can to intimidate. So they are intimidating Michelle McDonald by arresting her, um, and uh, she's also been falsely accused of a DUI. They didn't even take a blood uh, a, a breathalyzer, yet they're charging her with refusing to take one. Uh, she asked to immediately, when you get pulled over, you can immediately ask, I want to go straight to a judge. And she asked that, and the police officer didn't know what to do. Said she was speeding, but she, in my understanding wasn't speeding. Anyway, uh, she was smart, went straight to the hospital, got a blood test, and no drugs, no alcohol in her system. Still has been charged with a DUI. Uh, still has been charged with refusing to do a breathalyzer. Uh, and has been charged with the speeding and uh, a couple of other things. Uh, not a, not a, uh, uh, going against the implied consent law, which is unconstitutional. You got a right to use your vehicle. Uh, and you have a right to not give up incriminating evidence. Uh, so uh, they have to, the police have to find it. So, I mean, they're, they're just, this harassment of Michelle McDonald is going on. And so when this order came out, <laughs> you know, it, it should be in the arrest and, and the trial of Michelle McDonald for for taking the pictures in the courtroom. That's where he should be explaining why the attorney wasn't arrested. But understand this, the judge is saying, well, one, I never ordered the arrest. And two, the reason she remained in handcuffs while she's trying to defend her client who isn't there and doesn't have the paperwork is because she never asked to have the handcuffs taken off. Ah, ah. <laughs> you know, and then he's denying he was a part of it, even though he wrote the warrant. As my understanding, he wrote the warrant for the arrest. Um, this this is amazing, uh, unbelievable. Well, okay, uh, I think Michelle McDonald has a court date tomorrow morning in. Um, Dakota County on the DUI. My understanding is both the cases are going to be dropped, the DUI and the taking pictures in the courtroom. That's, that's kind of the rumor that's going on that both cases are going to be dropped. Well, whoop de doo Yes, that's a good thing. You should drop them. But second, this judge needs to be held accountable. And believe me, I am in the process of preparing the paperwork to go down to the legislature and explain to them what's happening with these judges and that. I mean, these are huge. This is unbelievable. In the years I've been doing this, there's been a lot of good cases. There's been a lot of good cases about judicial corruption and judicial misdemeanors, bad behavior, and nothing's happened. You know, this year, something's going to happen, I guarantee you. And we got some uh, rallies planned that are coming up that I'll tell you about later on. In uh, you know probably in the beginning of January, get down there, uh, be the first rallies held at the Supreme Court Justice Center. They have a nice little courtyard there. Um, it's never happened, but with this uh, information from the St. Paul Pioneer Press, uh, maybe people will start getting riled up about our judiciary. Okay, we have a phone call here. Uh, caller, uh, thanks for calling in. Do you have a comment, a question? Tim Kinley, thanks for the excellent show. All right, thank you. Thanks for bringing that issue up on uh, Judge uh, David Knutson. Is something like that available so we can read it on the Internet, that order? That sounds like a totally fascinating order. And the other point I'd like to make now, if... David Knutson's dad was the state senator. David Knutson was the state senator. Uh, you they must have all kinds of 
family and friends down in the state legislature. Yes. How are you? How far are you going to get down there at the <laughs> state legislature, or what kind of strategy are you going to use to show what's going on? I mean, he's another highly protected person. And again, I'm asking about the uh, commercial papers. Has either the Star Tribune or the Pioneer Press covered this really bizarre behavior by what whatever's going on down there in Dakota County? And, you know, the other point is, why is the Dakota County uh, County Attorney Department participating in this? Thank you. Why is the Dakota County what? The uh, prosecutor? County, the, yeah, the, you know, the County Attorney Department. Uh, yeah. Why are why, they why, not, uh, uh, dropping yeah. these charges? That's a good, that's a good question. Um, I think I have an idea. Uh, first of all, can you read the order? You know, I don't think he can. Uh, I think you actually have to go to the courthouse to get the order. Now I'm going to I'm trying to get it sent to me because now they're all on an electronic system. Uh, Dakota County, everything is to be filed electronically, and all the orders are to be brought out electronically. So if you know one of the parties, they can give you a copy, and I just haven't got my copy yet. Uh, so otherwise, you got to go down to the courthouse in Hastings to look up the court order and uh, get the files there um, because they, they don't cross boundaries from county to the state level. Um, so I can go down to the Supreme Court uh, library and look on their computer system and I can find the filings of briefs and the electronic copies there, but I can't do it from my home. Okay, so they, they make you take a step to go do something. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if I get it, um, you know, we're going to read it, you know, and read parts of it on the, on the show here. Uh, second of all, the str strategy down at the uh, legislature. Um, the strategy is Judge Knutson was down there all last year. Okay, and he was talking about judicial appointments and how great they are and we need to have judicial appointments and he was part of this um, uh, uh, impartial, judicial impartiality group for an independent uh, judiciary and he was down there, he was one of the point guys in promoting this and of course it's because of his legislature. He was not a state senator, he was a state representative. Um, if, if if I recall correctly, uh, because I tried to meet with him when he was a state rep, and he he would never meet with me. Um, I I think I'm understanding why now. So the strategy is to go down there and tell the truth, and the truth will embarrass him. And these people, they may be friends, but they got a bigger job to do, and and deal with this. And believe me, the legislature knows what's going on. They don't know all the details, and they don't know what to do. And they're actually, they're afraid of the judiciary. I, I guarantee you that. They are scared of the judges because they know, and they've heard the stories, and they know the power that judges have. They don't have the right. That's a different issue, but they have the power, and they're exercising it in these two cases and in many others, including myself. And you know what? You know, I'm putting myself out there. Yeah, I'm, I'm at big risk, and they've attacked, you know, and I've had to pay consequences that have been illegal. The judge's actions have been illegal. And so, anyway, uh, uh, boy, I forgot one of your other questions, but why is the prosecutor involved in this? That's a good question, and I think the prosecutors right now in the with Michelle Attorney Michelle McDonald and uh, Sandra uh, Grazzini Rucky's case uh, are starting to realize um, this is a big problem, and they're seeing that the judge. Remember, Dakota County, the judges down there have done this before. They end up being the judge, jury an executioner, <laughs> you know. They ended up being the judge, the prosecutor, uh, and the defendant. So they're, they're trying to play all branches of government here and, of course, rewriting the laws, uh, ignoring the laws, um, arresting people without warrants, and 
um, uh, and then prosecuting them with no attorney. They won't, uh, you, know, you know, Sovis has been in trouble, um, Stacy, a number of judges in Dakota County have been in trouble, and so it's taught this is what you can do. But the Board of Judicial Standards, because of the pressure put on people like this show and other people going down to the legislature and the board getting embarrassed, has finally stepped up and started to do something. And of course, as the Board of Judicial Standards said in the John Miser case, relating to Judge Lennon, who never took her oath of office for three years, is we can't do criminal cases. So the board is saying, implying that this was a criminal case, so we can't investigate it. Somebody else has to have the money to do that. So they've sent a big word. So why isn't the prosecutors out there uh, getting rid and forcing that judge off the bench because they vacated it by not uh, signing, swearing an oath of office, or signing it? I I don't know. You know, it's because the judges have a lot of power and so a prosecutor is told by a judge you better prosecute this we went to the effort to do the warrant file the charges you better prosecute it or if you come back before me in this court and you think you got a case and it's rock solid well too bad I'm gonna let that criminal out on the streets and see you lost your case and that goes against your reputation and what are you gonna do about it because I'm the judge I mean, now, not all judges are that way, but there are some of these. And you know what? These judges need to step up and start defending their turf and start defending their integrity. And it's not happening. Okay. We got another caller. Caller, uh, comment or question? Thanks for uh, Well, calling. I have a comment, Tim, and you did uh, hit on it uh, partially. And uh, what the judges and the attorneys have done is they've created their own uh, uh, people to judge them. And yeah. uh, you have uh, attorneys uh, looking at attorney cases. So the John Q. Public has absolutely no chance whatsoever to file a complaint about anybody because they police themselves. So uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's I, I would call the judicial branch uh, the high court. You got to understand the state as a people group inside the Minnesota boundaries. The state is a religious organization. <clears throat> uh, the people of the state, as a whole, decides what it values and what it says is moral. So, just recently, the people of the state of Minnesota, through their representatives, says it's moral to have. Uh, same-sex marriage, which, you know, it's an oxymoron. Those two words don't fit. Same-sex and marriage don't go together. It can't go together. It's, it's logically impossible because marriage is defined differently. So um, the people of Minnesota said, our morality is this way. And so what these judges have become is the high priest. And high priests even though they're supposed to have this moral code and abide by this moral code, which is the state laws, uh, they get an ego attitude of, I've got, I have this black robe disease. And they go and say, yeah, I have this power, what can you do about it? And you, you'll find that in any, you know, you'll find that in religious things. You know, of course, now the Catholic, uh, Priest names have been released, uh, some of them uh, that have been caught uh, or admitted to abusing uh, children. Um, you know, tip of the iceberg, but what, it's a power issue. And so you really need, as your judges, people with integrity in there. They need to be vetted by the people, and that effort to vet the judges has been greatly diminished and is trying to be taken away from the people where we can't elect our judges anymore. And a lot of people say, well, I don't know anything about them anyway. And I go, precisely, that's their intent. They don't want you to know. So they can do their deeds of darkness and hide and, and just browbeat people down and 
take their children, take their money, take their assets away from them so that they be quiet. You know, and now, caller, I, I appreciate your call. Um, in two weeks, uh, I'll be having a guest on, uh, hopefully, and it, it's going to knock your socks off. Because you, you, I, know, I know your situation and what you've gone through, and some familiar names are going to pop up, and uh, it's not going to be pretty. Uh, but it will vindicate you and some of your experiences. So, uh, two weeks, you're going to want to watch that show. Um, okay. Oh, where am I here? All right, that's, uh, that's enough on them because the major part of what I was going to talk on my program is this article, and now there's not a whole lot of time left, but that's okay. Um, front page, Pioneer Press, again, call in. Uh, 651-747-3838. If you've seen this article and have comments uh, that you want to make even before I get to them, because I don't know that I will. But uh, also, you can now watch my shows on YouTube. If you under, look under here, uh, youtube.com, Speechless MN, and you can watch some of the back shows. Or if you don't want to call in, you can email me at speechlessmn at gmail.com. Well, let's go through this article. Justice has spared financial disclosure. Minnesota among 42 states that flunked watchdog's test of public transparency. This is written by Rita O'Brien, Chris Young, and uh, Kaja Ware. And I apologize if I uh, butcher that name. Uh, so... Of course, this is a watchdog group for financial accountability, so they may be, you know, a little more aggressive in saying 42 states flunked watchdog test. Well, what was the watchdog test about? You know, was it too strict? Um, I don't know. I, I don't think so, but let's find out. Minnesota, along with 41 other states in the District of Columbia, flunked a test evaluating what state high courts justices must disclose about their personal finances. A Center for Public Inter uh, Integrity investigation shows. Okay, so we flunk this test about disclosure. So what were the aspects of the test that, that were flunked? Some states fail to ask the names of companies in which justices own stock. Others do not ask about the interest of justices' spouses or dependent children. Montana, Utah, and Idaho don't require justices to file any personal financial disclosure reports. Nothing. Okay, does Minnesota? You know, I don't know. Um, I have to read the article here. Uh, but I do know this. Judges don't have to disclose any gift they receive of $150 or under. By their code on judicial standards, they don't have to do that. It's, uh, that's amazing. That means you can flop down on a justice's desk. Here's $150. Turn around, walk out the door, come right back in, or just turn around. Oh, here's a gift of $150. There, there's no limit on the number of $150 gifts that you can give a judge. It's an exclusion in there. Um, does this happen? I don't know. Uh, people say it does. And uh, the other thing is, why wouldn't it? Now, the legislature, part of a branch of government, and the governor's office, another branch of our government, has restrictions that you can't give a legislature more than $5. And it's limited to that $5, It's my understanding. So, but judges have this $150, you know, over and over and over and over again. Uh, but the judiciary is another branch of government that we the people are supposed to be over and hold accountable to also. And why does not the judiciary have the same standards that the legislature has? Hmm. 
I wonder why. Despite the scant disclosure, the center identified 35 examples of questionable gifts, investments overlapping with caseloads, as well as other entanglements involving some of the 335 state Supreme Court justices. Now, I don't know if they're talking up here about, uh, oh, you know, no, this 335 state Supreme Court justices around all the 50 states. The center found justices who wrote opinions favoring companies in which they own stock. It also found justices who ruled on cases even when family members were receiving income from one of the litigants. That does not mean they ruled incorrectly. I, I, I'll give the justices that. They may have ruled correctly, but it's definitely an appearance of an impropriety going on. And it found justices who accepted, uh, better get here to 7A. Uh, justices who accepted lavish gifts, including a $50,000 trip to Italy. Now, I don't think the article says what judge got that. Um, Minnesota, this is interesting, Minnesota is toughening its requirements starting next year, meaning its lousy grade will undoubtedly improve. Legislation passed this year will require justices to file an additional form that other states' officials already file. So now we'll get up to some level with the other 42 states that are still bad. Uh, the form will ask justices to report investments, locally owned real estate, and even involvement in horse racing starting in January 2014. Boy, they sure put that one off. Because they could have had a, that started, oh no, that's, they could have had that started in June of 2013 uh, very easily because that's when laws usually come, you know, usually July 1st, uh, um, every three months, you know, they start new laws. But they put that out to January 2014. That means the legislature can go in and change that this year. And then they'll never have to do this. That's part of the game that gets played. Okay, um, but the new requirements will be phased in over six years, said Gary Goldsmith, executive director of the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board. So instead of doing it all at once, we're going to phase it in over six years. So that will give them more time to not do this. Minnesota now is at the back of the pack for financial disclosure requirements, ranking 45th in the country along with Iowa. I mean, this is bad. This is, this is really, really bad. Because these justices have a, a huge impact on people's lives. And we should have this blue sky out there. You want to be in the spot? Show your stuff. Recuse yourself from cases where you have a financial interest. People need to know what it is. Uh, and there's ways to do it like other people with the blind, uh, blind investments. You just give your money over to a, a blind pool. You don't get to know what's in it, but you have a manager manage it. And so, okay, uh, so Minnesota's at the back of the pack according to this study. I'm going to put that in there. Uh, you, know, it, you know, we don't know the details of the study. The state is one of three that does not release financial disclosure reports to the public except when requested in person. Oh, there's something I probably need to start doing. Request that information. Okay. Uh, it has a self-policing a uh, policing system for enforcing the disclosure rules in which Supreme Court justices would be asked to rule on a complaint about themselves. That means if a case that the Supreme Court justice, a case is coming before the Supreme Court justice and the justice knows, hey, I have a financial interest in the outcome of this decision, it is the judge who has to self-disclose that this is going on uh, in order for, their, for them to recuse themselves from the case. But if we don't know that there's this financial interest, 
how can we put pressure on them to recuse themselves? So it's a self-policing system. All right, we have a caller on the line. Uh, caller, you got? A, whoa, caller, you got a comment or question? Tim Kinley. The, yes. What is the rationale? What is the rationale that the uh, uh, the courts department gives for this one hundred fifty dollar gift uh, rule they have, where they can, the uh, judge can accept? Uh, donations in $150 increments. Do they have an explanation why that is good government and why that is in the best interest of the little guy? Uh, you know, <laughs> great questions. Um, from what I've heard, the answer is, and of course, why doesn't this answer apply to the legislature, is that, well, family members give gifts. You know, but this isn't about family members. Okay, they have other things to relating to family members and gifts that family members give. Um, there's no, there's no explanation. They don't have one that that I know of, and it's not written into the uh, code on judicial standards that I know of, uh, as to code of judicial ethics that I know of. I, I can't answer that, but it's a, it'd be good to know. Anything else? Anything else, caller? Am I there? Am I on? Yeah, yeah, you're still here. Oh, th thank you. All right. And so the the question the question I have is this issue: if it's for family gifts, can uh, state legislators and other elected officials receive? We're talking like birthday gifts and Christmas gifts and things like that. Right, but that's, that's, that's an exemption that's already written into the, into the Code of Ethics. Okay, so why the $150 for judges and it's not there for legislators? Right, wow. Now, do, when they have their hearings down at the state capitol and the court department comes in or the judges department comes in to get salary raises and things like, do these questions ever come up or is this all back room? Uh, business down at state capital. Um, I don't think they've come up. Uh, I know there has been some discussion about this. Hundred, I know the. Oops, I know the hundred and fifty dollar question is coming up. The legislatures know all about that. That's been told over and over again. And they find it hard to believe, yet they do nothing. <laughs> um, but as when the justices are there, asking for their money. No, I don't know that it's been been brought up at all. Uh, but again, one of these shows, I've got it laid out and I've given it to legislature. There's 26 areas that the legislature has authority over the judiciary. 26 areas. And one is on their ethics, the judicial ethics, but they do nothing. They leave it to the justices. They need to do something. Um, Okay. The state does not require justices to report gifts, investments such as stocks or financial debts on the one-page form. This is for Minnesota. Okay. The state does not, uh, the court communication director, John Kostoros, and I know John Kostoros. I mean, I met him. I go down there when I film. He's the guy I talk to. Nice guy. Very cordial. Um, very cordial guy. So um, he says Minnesota is less prone to corruption than, say, Illinois or New York. New York. <laughs> you really have to watch public officials in those states, Castor said. Minnesota has a very low tolerance for corruption. Well, I like John, but I think he's been bamboozled. Okay. And, of course, you hear this from the Minnesota uh, Justice Paul Anderson. Hey, we got an 84% favorable rating. We are the best state for our judiciary. They go through this rah-rah song and dance. Um, but they don't have the transparency. They're covering up what's going on. Um, people, the only reason we have the judicial representation that, uh, that we think we have 
the high quality that we think we have is because they're covering up what's really going on and they would expose the truth what's going on in our courtrooms Minnesota would not have this reputation and I think in the next year you're going to see this reputation go down significantly okay um, you know and if you don't know what's going on in the courtrooms and you don't hear about it why would you give them a bad grade you wouldn't but you know other states have spent the effort to go down and really really uh, expose what's going on and it goes into here about Justice Allen Page, who has a charity and 20 law firms given at least $1,000 to that charity. My understanding is the Star Tribune gave $25,000 to the charity when Page had some control over it. And there was actually a uh, case where Allen Page, uh, the Star Tribune, was before the court, uh, and Allen Page did not recuse himself. Now. Give that, given that, Alan Page is the best justice for family law issues. He's been trying to keep parents in their families, in their children's lives, and pushing that effort. And days are going by here. It's time to end the show. I encourage you to read this article on the front page of the Star Tribune. It does not give a favorable light to the Minnesota judiciary. It's too bad we couldn't cover more. But remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. Get out there and defend somebody's liberties. God bless. Have a great week. Good night. Sets on fire